happily, after lunch, I get to talk to you all about diabetes. So as your insulin's all working, we're going to talk about what happens when our patients don't have enough of it or if it can't work in the way it's supposed to. So in the next half an hour, I am going to try and go through all of this. So I'm going to go through what diabetes and DKA is and how it works in our patients. We're going to go through the common signs that we see in our DKA patients as well as how we diagnose, treat, and most importantly, nurse the patients who come in to see us with DKA. I'm not going to go too much into kind of non-ketoacidotic diabetes because that is a whole other talk for a whole other time. But if you do have any questions about that, please make use of the Q&A time that we have afterwards. So, first of all, what is DKA? Well, in order to say what DKA is, firstly, we need to do a little bit of a recap on our non-ketoacidotic diabetes. So diabetes mellitus is an abnormal increase in circulating glucose levels in the body. And this is seen either because there's a lack of insulin or because the insulin that's being produced can't work properly. It works very differently across dogs and cats. And that's a really fundamental thing for us to know when we're nursing these patients because this changes how we treat them and it also changes the advice that we give to our carers. So in dogs, most of the time, they have what we would consider to be type one diabetes. So this means that there's destruction of the beta cells in their pancreas, meaning that they can't produce enough insulin. Because they don't have enough of those cells to produce that insulin, this means that they will have to have treatment for life and there's no opportunity for them to go into remission in most cases. Cats on the other hand are quite different. So with cats, around 80 to 90% of them have what we would consider to be type two diabetes. And the other 10 to 20% have it due to quite specific other causes. So one of these, for example, is a condition called acromegaly. And this is where there is a pituitary mass which is secreting growth hormone, which causes insulin resistance and causes diabetes. Now in cats, we don't have a complete deficiency of insulin. The body is able to produce insulin. What we have is a combination of beta cell failure and insulin resistance. So this means that there's insulin being produced, but not very well from these failing beta cells in the pancreas. And then in addition to this, any insulin that is being produced isn't working properly at its target sites in the body. Because we've got this combination of resistance and failure and not a complete lack of insulin production, this means that in cats, if we get them under control quickly, we can actually theoretically get them into remission. So that is diabetes in general. Regardless of how diabetes occurs, so regardless of whether it's type 1 or type 2, the net result is the same, right? <coughs> what happens is these patients become hyperglycemic because there's either not enough insulin or it's not working properly. And the clinical signs that we see in our diabetic patients happen as a result of this hyperglycemia. So when the blood glucose level crosses what we call the renal threshold, we see our classic clinical signs. And the renal threshold is the point at which the blood glucose spills over into the urine, essentially. So in dogs, it's about 10 to 12 millimoles per litre, and in cats, around 14 to 16. And the signs that we will see in these patients are our classic PUPD, polyphagia, and weight loss. And then in cats, we may see a plantigrade stance, so due to diabetic neuropathy. And in dogs, we will see visual impairment. We'll see diabetic cataracts, potentially. In DKA, what we have is a complication of diabetes because the process is unregulated. So we'll get decompensation, which means that as a result, we end up with ketones being formed. And the result of this is metabolic acidosis. So how does this happen? Well, firstly, when glucose can't be used in the body as an energy source, because the body needs insulin to make that happen. So if you think of your cells, insulin is like a key which unlocks the door in the cell, allowing glucose to go in and be used as energy. If there's, insulin, if there's no insulin, sorry, 
what happens is that glucose can't go into the cell and be used. So the body thinks it's not got enough of an energy source available to it because the cells aren't able to produce energy. So the body then starts to look for alternative sources of energy. And what happens is it starts to break down fat, so it will break down lipids. And as a result of this, we'll get free fatty acids circulating in the bloodstream. And these fatty acids then get mopped up by the liver, where they're turned into to triglycerides and ketones. <clears throat> so these ketones are available to the body to use as an alternative energy source in the absence of glucose. There are three major ketones that we actually see. So we've got acetone, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And essentially what we have is when this process of the formation of ketones and the metabolism of these ketones becomes unregulated, that is DKA. Now, an important thing to note about DKA is we classically think of a DKA patient as being an undiagnosed diabetic, yeah? Where we've had a diabetic patient that's been pretty unwell for a while, maybe they've hidden it quite well, maybe the clients haven't picked up on it, not got them in for treatment soon enough, and then they present really sick in DKA. But quite commonly, and actually I would say for our patients perhaps more so, we see quite a lot of DKA also in established diabetics. So it's not just our undiagnosed patients. We will quite often see it in a diabetic patient who's become unwell, perhaps due to something like pancreatitis. So we can see it as a consequence of illness in our established diabetics as well. So what happens when our patients go into DKA? The first thing that we have is a lack of insulin. And then in combination with this, we have what we call an increase in counter-regulatory hormones. So our counter-regulatory hormones are other hormones that our body uses to increase our glucose levels in an emergency. So when the body can't get enough glucose into the cells to be used as energy. And these are hormones like adrenaline, cortisol and glucagon. So we've got physiological stress in the body. Our body's under stress. It can't get enough glucose in to be used as energy and a lack of insulin. So this means we've got more and more and more hyperglycemia. But at the same time as having that worsening hyperglycemia, the body can't do anything with that glucose because it can't send it into the cells to be used as energy and it can't send it into the liver to be stored as glycogen. So as a result of this, the body goes, oh, I don't have enough glucose. I don't have enough energy. I need to create more ketones because I'm using that for energy right now. So the liver makes more and more and more ketones. And then because two of these ketone bodies are acidic compounds, we also have an increase in acids in the body and in the bloodstream. So we have a combination of ketosis and metabolic acidosis. I'm just going to give you all a second before I move on. I can see lots of scribbling. Um, this is also being recorded. And if anyone wants to take a photo of my slide or anything, please feel free. <clears throat> so there'll be opportunity to catch up on this afterwards. Happy? Fab. Good. OK, so clinical signs then in our DKA patients. So as we said, we've got quite a lot of hyperglycemia as well as our, as well as our ketones building up. The hyperglycemia itself will cause dehydration. The reason for this is because we will get something called osmotic diuresis. So when our urine is full of glucose, in order to try and balance out that really concentrated with glucose urine, the body will put more water into the urine to try and balance it out. So our patients lose more and more and more fluid. In combination, they're also polyuric, so they're urinating more. So this means that we lose large volumes of fluid, and with it, we'll probably also lose some electrolytes. In combination with this, we have patients who are unwell, not really eating, not drinking enough probably, and we often quite, uh, quite often see vomiting 
in our DKA patients as well. So all of those things are also going to cause dehydration. So by the time these patients present to us, they are often quite markedly dehydrated. They can be quite, quite systemically unwell, collapsed, shocky. We can, if we catch it early enough, see them when they're a bit milder. So we can see anything from kind of mild dehydration and some PUPD to these really kind of classic collapsed unwell DKAs that we think of. So that's how we recognise DKA in our patients. So how are we then going to go ahead and diagnose it? Well, there's quite a few different diagnostic tests that we perform in our DKA patients. So these include our kind of normal blood, so biochemistry, haematology and electrolytes. We'll do a urine analysis. We'll check ketones, ideally on the blood. If you don't have a ketone meter available, you can put a drop of the plasma on a urine dipstick and assess the blood ketones that way. Or you can just do urine ketones. Ideally, we would do both. We also, if we can, want to do a venous blood gas. Does anyone have blood gas analysis in their practice? An EPOC or an ISTAT, something like that? Yes, fab. So technically, you can't say you've got DKA unless you've confirmed that your patient has got acidosis. And in order to do that, you would need to do blood gas. And then we might also go ahead and do some imaging. So maybe an abdominal ultrasound or some chest x-rays or both to have a look for any underlying causes that might have prompted DKA perhaps in an established diabetic. So looking for pancreatitis, that sort of thing. So they're going to be the tests that we perform. And in order to confirm that our patient has DKA, we need to have a combination of these three things. So we need to have a patient who's got hyperglycemia and glucoseuria, so glucose in the urine. We also want to have ketonuria and ketonemia, so confirming the presence of ketones in the blood and urine, and metabolic acidosis. And what we're looking for on our blood gas in these patients is a low pH, so that would indicate acidosis, so a pH of less than 7.4, a low bicarbonate, because that shows us that it's a metabolic acidosis, and these patients have a high anion gap. And what this is, is basically the difference between the negatively charged electrolytes and ions in the bloodstream and the positively charged ones. So it's the difference between our sodium and bicarbonate and our potassium, essentially. So this basically means, this high anion gap, means that we've got acidosis because there's extra acids in the bloodstream. And that's all those ketones because they're extra acids that shouldn't be there. So these three things confirm our DKA diagnosis. So once we know that we're dealing with DKA, we then need to think about treatment and nursing care. And these are really the areas where we come into our own as VNs. These patients often present really quite unwell and need really intensive care from us to get them through this. And then at the end, you're left with a diabetic patient who still needs a lifetime of ongoing care from us. So in terms of treating DKA, our main goals of treatment are firstly to restore their circulating volume. These patients are going to come in fluid depleted, probably in shock. We need to get their fluid levels back up to normal and get them cardiovascularly stable. We want to also reverse their metabolic acidosis. We want to return their glucose and ketone levels back to normal. And then lastly, we want to correct any other abnormalities that we see in these patients. So how are we going to do this? The mainstay of our treatment is insulin therapy. We use neutral insulin in our DKA patients because it's short acting and we can use it to reverse ketogenesis, so to stop the formation of these new ketone bodies and resolve their hyperglycemia. So our neutral insulin works really, really quickly. It has the most rapid uh, onset of action, but it's slow in duration. Uh, sorry, it's very short in duration. 
So what this means is we have to give it either as a constant rate infusion continually to these patients or as intermittent injections intramuscularly. You can use either. The CRI method is generally what we go for because we have a bit more control over it, whereas the intermittent IM injections, we, we don't have as much ability to titrate the dose as closely. If you're giving a CRI, you make it up uh, in a drip bag. It's light sensitive, so you need to wrap it, and it also binds to plastic. So when you're making it up and you're flushing the line through, you need to get rid of about 50 mils of your fluid out of the end so that you've had room to kind of coat the whole giving set with the insulin solution before you give it to your patient. And the rate at which we're going to give our uh, insulin CRI depends on the patient's blood glucose. So we'll have a chart up on the wall that says, if the blood glucose is above this level, give the patient 10 mils an hour of the CRI. And every hour, we will check the patient's blood glucose level and then depending on what it is, we'll adjust the rate of our CRI. When the patient's glucose level returns to normal, if they're still producing ketones, we can't stop the insulin because we need the neutral insulin to get rid of the ketones. So what we then have to do is add in a glucose CRI on top. So it seems a bit weird because you're giving a diabetic patient glucose but we need to continue insulin until the patient is persistently ketone negative. Then we can think about getting them onto a more appropriate long-term insulin. So if they're still producing ketones, but their <coughs> blood glucose is normal, we add a dextrose or glucose CRI on top. Our next considerations are fluid therapy and electrolyte levels and our electrolyte balance really, really key areas for us. By the time these patients come to us, as we've said, they're often significantly dehydrated with acid-base abnormalities. So we need to assess their hydration and their perfusion status really carefully. So looking for signs of shock and dehydration and then tailor the rate of their fluids based on these assessments. Generally, we would use Hartman solution in these patients to correct their acidosis if they have got metabolic acidosis because it has got that bicarbonate, that lactate in it. So that will help to neutralize that pH. And then a point regarding electrolytes. We've said that these patients can present with electrolyte abnormalities. If they don't, you will certainly cause them by treating the patient with insulin. Because one of the things that our neutral insulin will do is take potassium out of the blood and put it into the cells. So these patients will often, during treatment, develop quite significant hypokalemia. So this means that we're going to have to give our patients potassium supplemented fluids, most likely, and we're going to reassess their electrolyte levels really frequently. So normally around every six hours or so during hospitalisation. And then in addition to all of those things, we're going to provide our normal supportive treatment and care. So this might look like giving them antiemetics. So lots of our patients will present with vomiting or nausea. So we can reach for things like meropotent in these patients, so Serenia or Prevamax. <coughs> if you have a patient who is still nauseous on meropotent, we've got other options we can add in as well. So we don't just have to reach for that one and think, OK, there's, there's nothing else we can really do to manage their nausea. We can use medications like Ondansetron on top. Ondansetron works on different receptors in the GI tract. So it's essentially like giving multimodal analgesia, but to treat nausea, essentially. And then speaking of analgesia, we need to give opioids as required if our patient's painful. So for example, if you've got an existing diabetic who's then had pancreatitis, which has triggered a DKA, we want to make sure that we're providing treatment for that underlying condition as well. So that's the mainstay of treatment for these guys, but most importantly for us, how are we going to manage them and care for them as nurses? So there's a few key topics that I want to talk to you about regarding nursing our DKA patients. The first thing that we're going to be doing is a lot of monitoring. These guys present quite severely unwell. We're going to be checking their vital parameters really often. 
So checking body weight regularly, not just for appetite reasons, but because about 90% of our acute body weight changes are actually due to fluid balance in the body. So if you've got a really dehydrated patient, the next day after they've come in, you weigh them and their weight's increased significantly, it's actually more likely that you've corrected their dehydration and they've returned to a normal weight for them rather than there's been a significant change in food intake, for example. So patients receiving high rate fluids or where you're really, really uh, monitoring fluid balance carefully, we wanna be weighing them more often, probably around every 12 hours or so. We're also gonna be checking TPR really regularly, as well as looking at things like pulse quality, respiratory pattern and effort, mucous membranes and CRT, and then things like our blood pressure and hydration or perfusion status. So in addition to general monitoring for these patients, we're particularly interested in signs of fluid overload and also uh, any signs of electrolyte abnormalities in these guys. One thing to bear in mind with our DKA patients is that these parameters can change really quickly because the patients will, will be quite severely unwell on admission and then their, their status as they progress through the hospital can change quite rapidly. So we wanna be checking these regularly, probably around every four to six hours in our more stable patients, all the way down to every couple of hours or so in our more intensive ones. Nutrition is another really important consideration in pretty much all of our patients, but especially in DKA. Because things like blood glucose level, the rate at which we can give our insulin, all of these things are going to be affected by their food intake. They often present with anorexia, so we need to be intervening rapidly if they've eaten less than 85% of their RER for around the last kind of three days or if they've not eaten in the last two days. So these guys are gonna be pretty unwell. They're unlikely to kind of want to eat through the normal tempting methods. It's most likely that we're gonna to have to think about placing a feeding tube. If they're not well enough to be anaesthetized, something like a nasoesophageal or nasogastric tube is a really great option. We can often place them in conscious patients and we can be placing these as nurses under schedule three. And then once that's in, what we want to do is begin an appropriate kind of refeeding program with the recommended diet. So we want our diets to be complete and balanced and free of simple sugars, because that's going to make getting their blood glucose under control much harder. So for our, um, most of our patients, we can use something like recovery liquid. That's fine. If you've got a pancreatitis dog, you want to use probably something like GI low fat liquid. Another really important thing to think about for these guys is venous access and sampling. And this is an area where we as nurses can really advocate for these patients. Because if they're having hourly blood glucoses, they're gonna be pretty miserable quite quickly with the amount of pokes they're having to have. In addition to this, they're also having electrolytes or blood gases about every four to six hours and multiple fluids and insulin CRI maybe a glucose CRI and IV medications. So we're gonna really, really quickly run out of veins. That gives us a couple of options to improve the well-being of our, of our patients during the hospital then. One option is considering a central line, so a jugular catheter, which is what we've got going on here. So this top image, we've got three separate catheters or three separate lines within the same catheter placed into the jugular vein. This brown one we can use for blood sampling because we can take bloods from the jugular that the catheter's in. And then we've got an additional two separate lines here that can have IV fluids or medications run through them. So these are a really, really good option for our DKAs. There's also a version of this that you can place in a peripheral vein called a pick line or a sampling line, which again, we can use to take blood samples or you could consider placing a continuous glucose monitoring device. Anyone using these in practice? Yes, some yeses, fab. So we often use these for our more stable or non-ketoacidotic diabetics, but they're a really great option for DKA as well because they will continually measure the interstitial glucose 
and we can scan the sensor either with your app, your smartphone or with a reader and it will tell you in real time what the patient's glucose <coughs> level is and this can stay on for up to two weeks and it will read 24 7. So a really great option as an alternative to hourly ear pricks. And then in addition to this we want to think about all of our general nursing care. So particularly monitoring for things like pain or nausea and then providing any supportive care that the patient needs. In addition to things like recumbency care, often these patients present down to us collapsed. So things like bedding checks, turning the patients regularly, bladder care, that sort of thing as needed based on the individual. And then lastly, we also need to think about how we're going to care for these patients long term because DKA is only quite a short period of time in our diabetic patients' life with us. So in terms of transitioning them to a more appropriate long term treatment, we want to do this once the patient is consistently ketone negative and we have corrected their fluid, acid base and electrolyte balance. We can't give a subcut long duration of action insulin, so like a 12 hour insulin, to a dehydrated patient because it's not going to be absorbed and used in the same way in a dehydrated patient as it would be in a normovolemic or normohydrated patient. So we keep them on neutral insulin until all of this is fixed and then we transition them to a longer term insulin. And normally for dogs, the first one we would reach for is caninchulin. And in cats, the first one we would reach for is prozinc. If the pet is not already an established diabetic, we also need to do the full shebang diabetic discharge with our carers when they come to take their animal home. So we want to make sure that we're providing education and support to our carers from the nurses at a really early stage and then continue that throughout the patient's life. So getting them coming back to us to see us for diabetic nursing clinics, for example. Checking in with the clients and finding out how they're adjusting to life with a diabetic pet and whether they need any more support from us. This is a really, really big area of potential for us. It also highlights the role of the nurse to our clients, showcases how much we know and how much we can do, and it allows us to build deeper relationships with our clients and also our patients as well. The thing that we've gone through in the last half an hour, DKA is a really common complication of unregulated diabetes. It occurs when the body starts to break down fats as an alternative energy source because it can't use glucose. The signs that we see include things like PUPD, vomiting, dehydration, anorexia and weight loss. And most of our treatment is aimed at restoring the patient's fluid, acid base and electrolyte balance, reversing ketogenesis and returning blood glucose levels to normal. And then in terms of nursing, we're looking at nutrition, intravenous fluid therapy, sampling and venous access and monitoring and supportive care. And these are all really important areas where we can make a huge difference to our patients.